Okay, episode one of the Books and Booze book reviews foray into YouTube from just being an audio-only podcast. This is my very janky home studio, which is in my guest bedroom. And the keen observer will notice that my mic filter doesn't even have a filter on it. So if this gets any traction, I'll try to upgrade my hardware. But if this is your first time seeing this or hearing about this, the, the premise is that I read books, I come online to review them, and I match them with a drink of some sort. And the, the book every time, of course, changes, and I'll have a, I'll be drinking a different drink every time. And I kind of review the book, talk about what I'm drinking, why I chose to associate this drink with the book. That's the premise. I'll try to keep the intro short. And I've been doing different parts. So part one was I read five or six books written by French authors. It was part one, The French Bastards. Part two, Magical Realism. Part three, Gothic Fiction, so on and so forth. But for the first couple episodes on YouTube, I don't think I'm going to have a part. I'm just going to review the books I've been reading in the last month. And the first book um, that I wanted to review is Roland Topor's The Tenant. Unfortunately, I got this kind of lame. I got this online used. I got this kind of lame cover. I'll try to use my very amateur video editing skills to put the cooler cover right here, the OG cover. Um, and if you've heard of The Tenant, it may be because um, there's a movie called The Tenant directed by and um, Ro Roman Polanski, who also starred in the movie. I have not seen the movie, but from what I hear, it's pretty good, and it also sticks to the plot of the book pretty well, which is, as we know, pretty rare these days. Um, but this book is about a Frenchman named Tchaikovsky, who lives in a part of Paris where, for some reason or another, it's incredibly difficult to find a place to live. Um, and he has a budget and everything, so he's kind of stressing out trying to find an apartment, and he finally finds one. Um, but there's two problems. The first problem being that the landlord, Monsor Z, or Monsor Zai, I don't know, it's pronounced ZY. I'm going to call him Monsor Z. He's kind of a stickler for rules, and he's definitely a stickler for money and rent. So he's like your archetypal, tyrannical landlord, douchebag kind of guy. Um, but the second bigger problem is that the previous tenant, the only reason this room is available is that the previous tenant had flung herself out of a window and then attempted suicide. She's not dead yet, she's in the hospital, but it still kind of pushes people out of the way if they're trying to rent an apartment. But Trokovsky is not really in a spot where he can be very picky. But before he signs a rent, he wants to go visit the previous tenant, whose name is Simone, in the hospital. And so he goes to visit her. Um, and I have a passage I want to read from uh, the scene where he goes to visit her. Trokovsky had no great trouble finding bed 18. A woman was stretched out in it, her face covered with bandages and her left leg suspended by a complicated system of pulleys. The single eye visible through the bandages was open. Tchaikovsky approached the bed very quietly. He could not tell whether the woman had noticed him because the eye did not blink and she was so heavily bandaged that he could see nothing of the expression on her face. She seemed older than he had thought she would be. She was breathing with great difficulty, her mouth wide open like a black well in the center of a white field. He noticed, when the acute sense of embarrassment, that one of her upper incisor teeth was missing. If you've ever heard of the song One by Metallica, uh, or seen the music video, this kind of reminds me of that. Uh, I think the lyrics go, waking up I cannot see, only the only thing real is pain now, something like that. But it's just kind of, she's bandaged up, she has the one eye peering through, she's staring, she's not blinking at the ceiling, kind of blood curdling stuff, but it gets even worse on the next page. Um, the eye remained steadily fixed, contemplating some invisible point on the ceiling. Tchaikovsky wondered if she might not be dead, but just then a moaning sound came from the mouth, stifled at first, then swelling to an unbearable scream. Kind of horrific, terrible stuff there, and I guess Tchaikovsky's hospital visit didn't exactly go as he planned, probably didn't ease any of his tensions, but it's like I said, he didn't really, he was not in a place to be picky about his apartment. And uh, so he signs a lease in this apartment, um, despite that experience, and that's where his troubles uh, kind of start. Um, so, kind of the belly of the beast moment of the book is when he has a couple of his friends over, like, I don't remember the number, seven or eight people, and it's not exactly what I would call a party. It's like a housewarming get-together. They're drinking a little bit, they're playing games, they're flirting with each other. And then one of Tchaikovsky's new neighbors comes banging at the door, and he's like, what kind of establishment do you think this is? You can't come in here, move in, and make all this noise. There are other people that live here. 
I've had ex some experience with neighbors like this. A lot of you viewers have probably had experience with neighbors like this, especially in college dorms or if you've lived in uh, close apartments before. Uh, if you haven't, you're lucky. You probably know someone who has neighbors like this. So immediately Tchaikovsky kicks all of his friends out of his apartment. He's like, I just, this, I was like desperate enough just to get this place. I can't lose it for making noise on, on night one. But what he doesn't know is that all the neighbors are like this. They are super anal about people making noise. And this is just the beginning of the snowball effect. And as the book goes on, he gets more and more complaints about when he moves his bed over a little bit. Noise complaint. He's walking around with no slippers on. Noise complaint. Um, his music is over volume one. Noise complaint. Um, which is, it wears down on, on someone's psyche. Um, this, the paranoid neighbors and everything. Um, and that's one problem, which is a problem enough for me. But the other problem is that, um, Simone had left all of her stuff behind in her apartment. And by all of her stuff, I mean all of her stuff, her furniture, clothes, books, hair, uh, her incisor teeth, tooth that was missing is in, like in the wall in the apartment, uh, which is kind of a little bit creepy. And I will say I just moved into this place a couple months ago and the previous tenant had moved all of her stuff out, but still there was... Her hair is everywhere and there's a certain smell to each room and it just kind of is a little bit creepy and eerie. Like someone's kind of still here, their aura is still here, their essence is still here, but they physically are not there. And so I can't imagine, I mean, if she had left all of her, her furniture, her clothes, her books. And so uh, Tchaikovsky is a man who kind of is an aesthetic. He doesn't really have that much stuff. Um, so he kind of starts getting more and more into Simone's stuff, reading her books, seeing her clothes, finding her teeth and her body parts everywhere it's just it's kind of eerie sense and um what happens is he gets more and more absorbed into this crazy paranoid apartment and he'll come home from work and he's like well i can't walk around today i'll make too much noise i can't play my music i can't do anything but sit in one spot and read and he doesn't cook there of course because i would be making too much noise he eats out comes back to the apartment and uh the book is essentially about uh a mental breakdown uh, the various pressures of life that can wear down on someone. And um, it's an insight into the psyche of Trelkovsky. And the more complaints he gets, um, the more he gets detached from his own identity. He kind of changed, has to change the way he lives in eternity. He has to change the way he is. Um, and of course, he falls into a state of paranoia. He gets all into these conspiracy theories. He gets depressed. And I have a passage I want to read from after... Well, not after, but when he's just starting to break his own mind here. He, so he's this passage, he's crossed the neighbor in the hall, and it's kind of like what he's thinking in his head when he passes the neighbor. Look at me. I'm not worthy of your anger. I'm nothing but a dumb animal who can't prevent the noisy symptoms of his decay. So don't waste your time with me. Don't dirty your hands by hitting me. Just try to put up with the fact that I exist. I'm not asking you to like me. I know that's impossible because I'm not likable. But at least do me the kindness of despising me enough to ignore me. Crazy stuff. It's like uh, Topor tasked himself with writing the single most depressing, desperate sentence he could he could have thought up with. So this is just the first of many symptoms of a man who's going through a mental breakdown. Um, and eventually, this will be my official spoiler alert. I'll try to use my video editing to put spoiler alert up, or alert up here if you don't want to know what happens at the end. But... He spirals more and more into this mental breakdown and eventually it culminates in a balls to the wall, uh, psychedelic uh, images, gender bending, violent, suicidal, uh, I don't know, breaking of the mind. And um, it's a very, sh not very, it's a short book. You can see, I think it was 270 um, pages and it's, Impressive to me how much Topor could fit in here, how much insight into the psyche of a person he could fit in here. But primarily the book is about identity and how wrapped up we are in it with our identity and how that interplays with our psyche. And um, identity is a, a strong thing. If you have a good sense of identity, it's a strong thing to be attached to if you're going through pressures of insane neighbors and things like that. Um, but... The problem with Tchaikovsky is that the more he lives in this apartment, the more detached he gets from his identity. And in turn, he gets more absorbed into the identity of Simone. 
So he comes home and he starts reading his books and he tries to get into the mindset of what Simone would have been thinking. He starts trying on her clothes and wearing her clothes around the apartment. He puts her makeup on. He like is playing around with her tooth and trying to put her, her tooth in his face and stuff. So creepy stuff, but it's just like as he loses his identity, he gets more wrapped up in Simone's identity. Um, and by the end of the book, uh, again, spoiler alert, he begins wearing her clothes out in public and wearing his makeup out in public. And he has these psychedelic crazy things going on where he's seeing lions and he's getting in fights with homeless people and knocking them off their buckets that they're sitting on. Very insane mental breakdown. But like I said, the, the, primary, the primary message that Topor is trying to get across here is, I think, the interplay between identity and psyche. And there's also, it's also kind of about, about guilt, whether it's imagined or not. Um, Trokoski, from the get-go, has this sense of guilt. He feels guilty about living in this apartment where the previous tenant had tried to kill herself. He feels guilty for making noise. He, there are some kind of, I don't want to say sex scenes, some, I don't know, intimate scenes where he's just like feels awkward and he feels guilty that a girl would even be giving him attention in the first place. And um, so it's about guilt too, but that's just thrown into the crock pot of identity and um, psychosis really in the end. And there's a cool thing that Topor does that I liked and it also gave, is like a kind of disarming way of uh, incorporating humor in is that he would have dialogue in the book, but it, were, it would really just be what Trelkovsky was thinking. So he'd be walking down the street and there's insight to what he was thinking. And I, I don't have any quotes written down or anything, but if you read the book, keep in mind that I like that part. I thought those parts were funny, but it's also kind of like, I don't know, it just kind of tracks his mental breakdown. And we see how he goes from just a normal guy who goes to work, he has friends, he could listen to music, and to this crazy guy who thinks everyone's out to get him and um, is beating people up and stuff. And uh, the insight into his mind was just a way to keep track of that. Um, as far as writing style goes, I read online a lot of people thought that he had similar writing style to Camus. Uh, Dostoyevsky, Poe. This is definitely very uh, Franz kafka -esque. If you've read Kafka and you like Kafka, you're going to like this book. Um, admittedly, I've only ever read The Metamorphosis and The Trial, but when reading this, I was like, this is totally Kafka and uh, Dostoyevsky. Um, my favorite part about his writing style is that he has a unique way of just making us feel eerie, making us feel creepy about things without ever saying those words. He interacts with people who we get a sense of kind of I don't know, spindly, ghastly people, but he didn't use those words. Um, and even his apartment, just by doing things like um, how he wrote about Simone leaving her incisor tooth behind and the way he described her clothes, it's just eerie without ever saying that. It's very impressive. It's something I could not do if I were to write a book like this. Um, I like this book a lot. It took me, I think I read in a day or two. Let me double check here. Oh, I said 270. It's not 270 pages. It's 170 pages. So you could definitely easily finish this at one sitting if you wanted to. Pretty creepy. If you want it, leave a comment. I might be able to send it to you. We could do a book trade or something. I would rate this probably four out of five stars. A solid four out of five. And to drink, I'm actually drinking a kind of strange concoction of um, Harney and Sons hot cinnamon spiced tea. It's a hot tea. Um, it literally just tastes like cinnamon to me. And I just poured some uh, rye whiskey in it. And that's because when Trokovsky was just balls deep in this mental breakdown, he decided uh, through logic, doesn't really make logical sense to me, that he needs to start pulling all-nighters. If he falls asleep, everything's going to break down. People are going to come get him. Of course, in reality, they weren't going to. Um, so he's staying up all night. That's why I chose tea, caffeinated tea. just kind of made sense. And then, uh, of course, as the book goes on, it gets more and more kind of mind bendy. He sees these things that aren't really happening outside his window. And that's why I picked rye whiskey. Um, just because I think out of all the liquors, um, bourbon and rye kind of have the tightest grip on my on the mind. And to be fair, the first time I tried this drink, I don't like it very much, but I kind of like it now. You, you got to mix it in. The first time I did it, I just poured in the, the bourbon, the rye on top, didn't mix it in. It did not taste very good. But that was the tenet. If you've read about it, if you disagree with me about what this is about or whether you like it or not, just comment or DM me. I don't know if you can DM on YouTube or not, but leave a comment. So this is episode one. I think next episode I'm going to do um, the picture of Dorian Gray or I might do Against Nature. I'm going to do one of those two. But thank you for listening if you're still here. Um, a tune for your time. I'm waking up.
Is I 